I'm Jonathan Schreier from the State Department, where I'm the Acting Special Representative for Global Food Security. I'm also the Deputy Coordinator for Diplomacy for Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security uh, initiative. And so it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here, those here in the room, those tuning, tuning in via webcast, uh, those downstairs in the overflow rooms, uh, to this Feed the Future Public-Private Partnership Technical Forum. I'm delighted to see so many representatives from agriculture-related industries and institutions ready to work in partnership with the U.S. government to advance the goals of Feed the Future in our common effort to foster agricultural development and bring sustainable food security to the world. I want to take a moment to just cover some housekeeping points before we move into the, the substantive portion of the program. <coughs> this plenary session, as well as the closing plenary session, are being <coughs> webcast. So they'll, they're being webcast and therefore will be available through feedthefuture.gov over time. Um, also on a more uh, practical housekeeping note, uh, uh, men's restrooms are here on this floor. Women's restrooms are one floor down on the second floor. There are drinking fountains in the, in the hallways. Um, we would ask that uh, participants uh, not use cameras or recording devices of any kind, although of course you're welcome to take notes. Um, we would also ask that you put cell phones on silent or vibrate so that uh, um, speakers aren't disturbed as, as we're going through the program. Uh, and then I uh, would just point out that there are a number of fact sheets and other materials that have been put on your chairs. Uh, those include some reference slides uh, that I believe uh, Dr. Wotecki will be using during her remarks in this, in this uh, opening plenary. So back to the substance. Let me begin by uh, just describing the overall context of Feed the Future's work in partnership with other sectors. Um, this, this program today is not the first partnership forum the U.S. government has organized in Feed the Future, and I'm sure it will not be the last. It follows a model that, that has been part of Feed the Future from the beginning of consulting with civil society, of consulting through, for example, the research forum with university partners last summer of consulting with colleagues uh, in, the, in the private sector and in the financial sector, uh, more, uh, as well as international institutions. I want to acknowledge the, the importance of other partners, universities, host country governments, development partners, implementing uh, actors, and so on, who are not in the room with us today, but who will be critical players in moving our discussions forward and in accomplishing progress on the goals of sustainable food security. You're going to hear more about Feed the Future's overarching efforts uh, in, in uh, engagement with the private sector from our keynote speaker, Administrator Dr. Rajiv Shah from the U.S. Ag Agency for International Development, who will be joining us just a bit later. Um, today I want to start by giving you an overview of the roots of Feed the Future. It began with the, the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative that was launched in 2009. On, on the sidelines of a, a G8 summit. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about how the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative and Feed the Future, the U.S. government's effort, uh, are different from what we, the U.S., and what other donors have done in the past. So first, the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, launched in L'Aquila, Italy, uh, in July 2009, brought together not only leaders of, of the group of eight countries, but also leaders of developing countries, key emerging economies, uh, um, as well as international and regional organizations such as the United Nations, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and others, uh, who came together and said, we have to change the way we're approaching agricultural development. For too long, we've neglected this field. Funding levels had declined from their peaks decades earlier. We need to put more resources in, certainly, but we also need to approach the challenge differently. And so the, the leaders who came together pledged to both put more money against the problem and to do things differently with that money. For the United States, President Obama pledged $3.5 billion over three years, and this leveraged another $18-plus billion from other governments, so that there's over $22 billion over three years pledged by the G8 plus other uh, donor, donor governments. 
And uh, I'll tell you more about how we're, we're keeping track of that money in a moment. Um, but uh, in, after, after the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative announcements came the, the uh, development of the U.S. Food Security Initiative, Feed the Future. Um, both the, the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative and Feed the Future are guided by a certain set of principles that came uh, to be known as the Rome Principles when they were adopted by the governments of 190 plus countries in November 2009 at uh, a World Summit on sustainable food security. And, and these, these uh, priorities, uh, these principles really tell us that we need to approach the challenge of agricultural development by following the lead of the developing countries that we're working with. It, that is, if a developing country knows where it wants to go to attain sustained food security over time for its population, we should be feeding into their priorities rather than just working on our own pet projects from a given uh, donor government. Um, and that moreover, we need to be working together, strategically coordinating our efforts. We need to be taking comprehensive approaches that take account of short-term needs and long-term uh, development assistance, that we also need to look at cross-cutting issues like nutrition, gender, uh, climate change, and other natural resource management challenges. Um, and we need to take advantage of the, the, uh, the, the strengths of multilateral institutions uh, when they can be brought to bear to help our efforts. And then we need to make sure we actually do what we say. That is, we need to hold ourselves accountable for fulfilling our commitments. In connection with this whole uh, renewed effort uh, uh, at the G20, um, governments came together to launch the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, a new approach to uh, uh, bringing additional funds into the, into the battle against hunger. And uh, this is a multi-donor trust fund that is housed at the World Bank, but it's really run by a committee that includes the donor governments, plus, uh, importantly, uh, a donor philanthropy, the, the Gates Foundation, as well as representatives of civil society from both the North, the global developed countries, and the global South. And so that it's a real uh, path-breaking, pioneering effort uh, that has brought uh, about half a billion dollars so far to the table uh, to, to uh, um, uh, award to, donor, to, to uh, developing country governments uh, that, uh, um, that uh, apply for these funds. <clears throat> Finally, uh, I just want to say a couple of words about the State Department's role in, in the Feed the Future effort. Um, Secretary Clinton has been a, a, a real leader on this, on this challenge of, of addressing world hunger and of, of meeting the challenge through renewed U.S. efforts and renewed global efforts. Uh, we've um, <clears throat> also uh, been uh, um, instrumental in, in tracking the, the efforts of governments that have committed to this effort. Uh, recently, as the U.S. Took, took the chairmanship of the Group of Eight process for 2012, we also took charge of the L'Aquila Fo the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative follow-up group, known as AFSI, which has been tracking investments by the donor governments that made pledges in 2009 to see whether we're actually following through on what we said. And so far, this effort has been uh, um, focused on tracking the financial pledges uh, to give more money, our $3.5 billion, other countries, similar commitments of, of, uh, of pledged funds. But we're also trying to push things farther to show the world what it is we're doing with all that money. And so we hope by, uh, over the course of this spring to be rolling out a much more detailed look at what, what donor governments are doing to fulfill their, their commitments at L'Aquila. We also, uh, at the State Department, have been pushing, uh, working with other parts of the U.S. government in this whole of government efforts, uh, we've been pushing policy reforms in the countries where we do our work. Um, and this, this includes, for example, uh, a trip that Administrator Shah and our ambassador to, to the UN food agencies in Rome and I took to the Horn of Africa uh, last fall to uh, follow up on a, on a call that Secretary Clinton made to the leaders of Ethiopia and Ken Kenya to make changes in their policy environments to enable agriculture sector-led growth in their countries. And so this was something that Secretary Clinton thought we needed to do even in the face of an emergency, a food security emergency going on in the Horn of Africa. We have to keep our eyes focused on the long term, even when we're dealing with the short term challenges. And so these are some examples of, of how uh, we're putting the tools of diplomacy 
to good use in the, in the battle against hunger. You'll hear from some of the other speakers uh, some of the other ways that the U.S. government is, is uh, confronting the challenge um, in a coordinated effort. And so uh, to, to uh, just tell you how things are going to flow, we're going to hear from uh, a speaker from the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Hillary Chun, then from USDA, Under Secretary Kathy Wateki, and then from the Global Harvest Initiative, Bill Lesher. Um, and then we'll be joined, if, if uh, traffic doesn't intervene, um, by Administrator uh, Dr. Rajiv Shah from the U.S. Agency for International Development. And so uh, um, we'll start uh, with, um, with Hillary Chun from OSTP. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Welcome to the White House Conference Center. Um, I hope that you find it to be a comfortable setting for the conversations you'll have throughout the afternoon. The title of the building is a little fancier than the actual facility, so um, it's a working building. I hope that um, I hope we can get a lot done here this afternoon. As Jonathan mentioned, I'm Hillary Chen. I'm here from the Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, here at the White House. And I'm here on behalf of Tom Khalil, who had to be out of town today and so sends his regrets, but um, would have liked to have been here. I wanted to take a minute to step back and put this afternoon's session in the context uh, within the administration's global development agenda. And as you may know, in the first ever uh, government-wide global <coughs> development strategy, which was drafted last year at the request of President Obama, an emphasis has, has been placed on broad-based economic growth. And as all of you here will know well, um, agriculture, produ agricultural productivity and improved nutrition are essential components for broad-based economic growth. And so it's a fitting conversation to be having here and as one of the administration's priorities. From the beginning, the administration has been committed to innovation and partnership as two tools for making progress on global development challenges. As the President said um, at an event that we had recently, a core part of my global development strategy is harnessing the creativity and innovation of all sectors of our society. So he directed us to bring game-changing innovations from both within the U.S. government and from outside of the U.S. government to bear on global challenges. The President's charge is to take an all-hands-on-deck approach. So for that reason, Feed the Future has been engaging with many critical partners throughout its, its evolution. These include ongoing consultations with host nations, monthly consultations with civil society, and continuing engagement with the academic community, which I know is particularly important in the creation of the Feed the Future research strategy. Today's discussion is with another set of critical partners, the private sector. The technical and market know-how of the private sector is an essential part of any food security effort, whether it be deployment or improvement of technologies and approaches in irrigation or seeds or insurance, or the creation of truly game-changing technologies to produce nutrients with dramatically reduced need for arable land or fresh water, the private sector is a critical partner in all of those efforts. Thus, the purpose of today's discussion is to compare notes on areas of expertise, priorities, and plans in order to identify potential partnership areas between the private sector and the U.S. government in support of the goals of Feed the Future. And this is in the ever, as we'll be ever cognizant of the need to double productivity to meet projected demands uh, for food in 2050. Given global challenges in water, food security, and energy, this is a tall order. But we hope that today's sessions will reveal opportunities for additional collaboration to bring us closer to meeting these challenges. It's important to note, as Jonathan did, that the conversation will not end today, nor does it end with those of us who are participating here in the room or in the online and virtual sessions that are going on simultaneously. All are welcome and needed in this endeavor, and I encourage you to reach out to friends and colleagues who might not have traditionally worked in agriculture to see how they could be involved. After all, innovation occurs best when we work across disciplines, so it's the job of those of us who think about food security day to day to think creatively about whom to reach out to and whom we can bring into this conversation. I wish you the best in your conversations today and look forward to working with you and others moving forward. I'll be sort of wandering around at the sessions. Feel free to reach out, um, and if you have any questions either about the facilities or what we're working on, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. 
and now we, uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Kathy Wotecki, who's the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. She's also their Chief Scientist. Kathy, thanks. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I'd like to add my warm welcome uh, to the others you've received so far this afternoon and uh, talk about uh, ag research and development needs from the perspective of uh, the Department of Agriculture, our partnership with uh, the Feed the Future initiative, and also to provide you with some background about the roles that the private sector plays in this very important uh, area of assuring future food security. I frequently frame my comments when I'm, when I'm speaking around the grand challenges that we've focused our research programs on with, at the Department of Agriculture. And the first of these is uh, domestic and international food security, it's certainly the topic of uh, the discussions this afternoon, and also one in which our research programs p play a, a, a really major role. Um, our, our role is primarily domestic in orientation, although we do have some international research programs. Uh, but so much of the research that we support for domestic purposes also is widely applicable um, in similar agroecological regions around the world. So it's a natural focus for us to be both domestic as well as global. Uh, a second grand challenge for us is human nutrition, uh, providing insights into the nutrient requirements as well as the food patterns that are necessary for lifelong good health. Third challenge area is food safety because you're not going to have food security and you're not going to have lifelong good health if the food supply is not safe. Fourth area is in bio-based products and biofuels. We are increasingly looking to agricultural sources as the means for producing chemicals from ones that go into manufacturing purposes to pharmaceuticals that are based on petroleum-based products. But agriculture is a way to produce these chemicals, and, but we need to have the appropriate systems in place to make sure that we are not compromising our food security and, and the other priorities in looking to build more of our economy on bio-based products. The fifth challenge area is going to influence our ability to achieve any of the other four grand challenges, and that is that uh, climate change is increasingly uh, leading to more variable weather patterns and is going to also influence our ability to develop agricultural systems that are long-term sustainable and that are going to be able to produce the other four <coughs> of these grand challenges. So I look at our food and agricultural R&D agenda as really being at the heart of the solution to all of these uh, grand societal challenges. Uh, there are a variety of different studies that show that we're going to need to increase our agricultural productivity dramatically by mid-century to feed the projected population. The projections range from 70 to 100 percent increase in agricultural productivity. To meet this growing global demand for food, animal feed, fiber, as well as biofuels and bioproducts. And accomplishing that is going to require that we really have a robust investment in the food and agricultural sciences from both the public and the private sectors. I think also underlying um, this uh, necessary increase in agricultural productivity is also what I've referred to as the preservation gap. We have to have the food processing industry present in these discussions to address how we can decrease the losses in agriculture, uh, both pre-harvest as well as, as post-harvest. 
growth and productivity of the global food and agricultural system is going to be largely determined by today's investments collectively by public and, and private sectors. And in recent decades, the private sector really has become the major player in developing innovations for food and agriculture, factors that are spurring private companies to invest in food and agricultural research include the emergence of biotechnology and other new scientific approaches, uh, the strengthening of intellectual property rights over agricultural innovations, new regulatory requirements, the expansion of markets for improved agricultural inputs as well as food products, and also rising consumer demand for more diverse foods. More recently, rapid growth in the market for biofuels has pushed companies to expand their R&D investments in this area as well. Um, the Economics Research Service in USDA has recently released a report on research investments in market structure in the food processing, agriculture input, and biofuels industries worldwide. There's a flyer in your folder uh, that's a summary of this report. It gives you uh, the website also where you can find more information. And um, I'm going to be making some reference to some of the graphs that are included in that. And we've also included in your folder a piece that looks like this that, uh, that has uh, those graphs reproduced. Uh, the first one um, highlights the public and private spending on food and agricultural research worldwide in 2000. Now, that's a over a decade ago. But it's a, a point in time where there were some very good data available. Uh, at that point, the global total food and ag R&D investment was estimated to be $29.3 billion, uh, with the public investment at $16 billion, uh, slightly uh, ahead of the private food and ag investment of $13 billion. But if you look at the OECD countries, the 34 OECD nations, as shown on the right-hand side of that pie chart, the private sector actually plays a somewhat larger role in the funding of food and agricultural research and, and development in the developed countries, members of, of OECD. Uh, in its work, ERS has updated a lot of these figures to 2007, so that's now the latest year for which comprehensive estimates for the private sector are available. And in 2007, that private sector investment in ag R&D, ERS estimates to be $19.7 billion. Uh, about 56% of that in food manufacturing, food processing, and 44% in agricultural input sectors. Uh, this is about half of the total uh, public plus private spending on food and agricultural R&D in the high-income countries. The, the second graph uh, shows you that the United States is about average uh, in its research intensity in food manufacturing. And in this uh, intensity is defined as R&D spending as a percent to food manufacturing value added. And you can see the U.S. kind of nested in, in the center of the list of countries across the bottom of that bar graph. And then the third point is that these research intensities vary widely among the agricultural input industries. Um, and again, this uh, research intensity is uh, R&D spending as a percent of industry sales. The incentives that companies and sectors have to invest in R&D are influenced by a number of factors. Uh, market structure is one of them. Um, and the agricultural input industries in particular have undergone some very significant structural changes over the past two decades with a considerable amount of concentration occurring. A relatively small number of large multinational firms with global R&D marketing networks uh, account for most of the R&D in each input industry. And rising market concentration has not generally been associated with increased R&D investment as a percentage of industry sales. So these data suggest that there's room for more private investment in the food and agricultural research area. 
Uh, though, as we know, food and agriculture is an extremely large, broad sector uh, that includes a wide range of industries, and certainly each one of those has a unique perspective as well as a unique contribution that they could make. What we also know, however, is that all of these different industries can play an important role in Feed the Future and the overall goal of what is known as sustainable intensification. Mm -hmm. And this is the approach that's taken by the Feed the Future research strategy. The research strategy aims to align our diverse research interests and investments so the private sector can continue to play an important role in stimulating broad-based economic growth by focusing on environmentally sustainable productivity gains, impact-oriented research, and dissemination of research outputs through a variety of different approaches, including extension education, as well as other programs at the county level. The strategy aims to do this by concentrating on the major research goals or the big ideas that are the framework for Feed the Future. And those include developing high yielding, climate resistant, resilient cereals, um, addressing animal and plant diseases, and improving legume productivity. This applied research for productivity, profitability, and resilience is designed to help improve policy environments, address both under and over nutrition, which are occurring simultaneously in developing countries, and increase availability and access to nutritious foods, and aims to do so through geographically focused, problem-driven dri research in four agroecological zones. The agroecological zones include the Indo-Gangetic Plains with a focus on Bangladesh, uh, Eastern African maize mixed cropping zones, including parts of Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya, the Sudano-Sahelian region with a focus on Ghana and the Ethiopian highlands. And these zones were identified because they exhibit a high prevalence of poverty, high prevalence of malnutrition, and also a high potential for agriculture to stimulate growth. This Friday, uh, at the Agricultural Outlook Forum, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities is going to be issuing a report called Feeding 10 Billion, a dialogue between the, feed, the future and the international research community. And under uh, leadership from the U.S. Agency for International Development, some coordination on the part of USDA. Our colleagues at the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities uh, organized a process for university-based researchers to have input into the research agenda of Feed the Future. The report is a product of this partnership and is going to provide some additional insights into the most productive uh, ways forward uh, in the research strategy. So from my perspective, it's clear that in global agricultural R&D, the public and the private sectors have a mutual interest to meet a growing demand. Accompanying this interest is the opportunity to develop partnerships to strengthen our collective efforts in addressing these challenges in the 21st century. And you'll find in the background papers for each of the breakout sessions, there are some concrete examples that are provided for each one of existing public-private partnerships in support of uh, each of these topical areas. We're particularly pleased from the research perspective with uh, the wheat genome initiatives, public-private partnerships. There are several of those as well as the Common Bean Genome uh, Collaborative Research Program. I appreciate all of your being in attendance today and your willingness to participate in the breakout sessions. As you move into those sessions, I really want to urge you to consider taking uh, this as an opportunity to, to create some ownership in Feed the Future. Uh, for you personally, for the companies that you represent. So thank you so much for your willingness to come today, and we're really looking forward to some of the ideas that come out of the workshops. Thank you all. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, now I'd like to introduce Mr. William Lesher, 
who is the executive director of the Global Harvest Initiative. Um, Bill, come on up. And uh, Bill brings experience that cuts across private sector, executive branch, and legislative branch work. Um, so I'm looking forward to his remarks. Yeah, you get my age, you bring experience in all different uh, areas, that's for sure. Uh, thank you very much. I first want to say thanks to the Feed the Future of officials. Um, this is, uh, I know you've been reaching out to research uh, institutions, you've been reaching out to all interested parties, but this is the first one you've reached out to the private sector. And I can only speak for the four members of Global Harvest Initiative, but we do appreciate that very, very much. The current members, a little background on Global Harvest to give you a, a sort of an outline as to why we're now involved in global food security issues and feel so passionate about it. The current members are um, DuPont, IBM, uh, John Deere, and Monsanto. And about um, three years ago, you know, you all know that there are food price spikes. And so an alliance was formed to say, all right, let's take a look at the global food security issues. How significant are they? How deep the challenges are? And so we held two widely held symposiums. We had experts do studies. And we finally concluded that this is a major challenge, doubling output over the next 40 years. And doing it in a sustainable way is a significant challenge, not only producing the amount, but the kind of infrastructure that goes along with that is enormous. So we, uh, we did a few things. We uh, developed white papers. We decided we're going to focus on global agriculture productivity. And that's, uh, we focus on that like a laser beam. Uh, so we did five white papers on important issues, we think are important issues to productivity increases, uh, whether it be research, new technologies, trade, effective international development programs, and private sector investment. We hired an economist to do a, an analysis of the, what we call the investment gap from the private sector. Now, I, I know all of you could poke holes on this because this is a different, difficult task to do. But we estimate, you know, you're basically lack about $90 billion a year in private sector investment to meet the challenges in a sustainable way. So, as you can see, our, our sort of uh, areas of focus are, are really match up, really, uh, almost identical to Feed the Future. We've had some initial discussions about these important areas uh, with uh, Lana and Julie and Jada and all the others that uh, work on Feed the Future, and we do appreciate that. And so these are four areas that we think are important that you're going to talk about this afternoon and they think are important you're going to talk about this afternoon. So I'd just like to say uh, one thing, and that is, what do you want out of this today? Well, you, we all know there are challenges, but we need to get beyond the challenges. There's lots of conferences and discussions about the challenges. We all have a good picture about that. They're significant and real, and they're not going to go away. So. Today, you've got four areas, and you're going to break up, and you're going to go into discussion groups, and you want to say, okay, can we maybe define the uh, discussion areas a little bit more precisely that makes sense? Can we, in fact, identify things that we can collaborate on, that we have mutual interest on? And then finally, <laughs> concrete steps of moving forward, not just talking, again, about what the problems are, we're saying, can we come to grips with some things, uh, whether it's uh, maybe projects eventually or areas of collaboration that really make sense and could, you know, let's face it, businesses are under pressure to, not, you know, save as much money as you can. Governments clearly are under the pressure of saving as much money as you possibly can. So you got to leverage it. you got to leverage the funds that the government's going to put out there, and the private sector has got to collaborate with those funds to make the, the, the benefits of this the biggest possible. So again, I just want to give a big thank you to the Feed the Future, uh, certainly, and a thank you for the private sector showing up. It's a good showing today, and really do appreciate that, and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you.
Thank you, Bill. So uh, Dr. Shah is, I think, stuck in that uh, traffic that I made reference to a moment ago. So let me just take a moment and tell you what I would have told you after his remarks so that we can just cut straight to the breakout sessions. Um, after Dr. Shah speaks, we'll be um, um, breaking up from this room to move into the, the breakout sessions. I believe you've all already signed up, uh, as indicated by the stickers on your badge, for particular breakout sessions. Um, and uh, the breakout sessions uh, are going to be starting promptly at 2 o'clock, unless we have to push them back five minutes to allow uh, Administrator Shah to finish his remarks. Um, the breakout sessions are off the record except when explicitly stated otherwise, such as to report interest in specific follow-on potential partnership discussions. So in other words, if someone says, please show up at such and such building at such and such time to continue the discussion, obviously that you should record that and share that with uh, uh, others who might be interested in participating. Um, the agriculture, finance, and risk management session will be here in the Truman Room. The other three breakout sessions will be directly below us on the second floor. If you have not already picked up your uh, name badges and placards, those are available on the table by the door. Please take them with you to your breakout session, whose door, the doors of which will be clearly marked with the same color dot as on your name badge. Staff are around who will be able to direct you to the right room. Please also take the fact sheets with you that have been left on the, the chairs here, as they may be useful reference materials in the discussions downstairs or in this room. And then uh, everyone will be coming back to this room promptly at 4 p.m. for the closing plenary. And uh, there you'll be joined by my partner in crime, the Deputy Coordinator for Development for Feed the Future from USAID. Uh, that's Jada McKenna. Um, at this point, I uh, just want to check, should we take a pause in place uh, uh, while we wait for, actually, why don't I give you a, a quick introduction to Dr. Shah, so that uh, <coughs> when he walks in the door, he will be already introduced and uh, ready to speak. So Administrator Shah serves as the 16th Administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development, and there he leads the efforts of more than 8,000 professionals in 80 missions around the world. He started in that job uh, by being sworn in on December 31st, 2009, and in that time he's had a, a, a real uh, a challenging ride because he uh, uh, managed the U.S. government's response to the devastating 2010 earthquake in uh, uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. He co-chaired uh, the, the, um, the State Department's first ever review of American diplomacy and development operations. And now he spearheads uh, President Obama's Feed the Future initiative, which you heard about uh, um, throughout the remarks today, and you'll hear more about when, when he joins us. Uh, he's also leading an effort called USAID Forward, which is a set of reforms in how USAID manages its uh, business model around uh, um, areas such as procurement, science and technology, and monitoring and evaluation. And he comes to this job with a, with a tremendous wealth of experience. Um, he uh, uh, had uh, um, Dr. Wotecki's job previously at the Department of Agriculture, so he knows uh, what uh, um, USDA has to bring to the, the challenge of food security, and uh, he knows the, the, the science side of the business. Uh, he also uh, um, spent seven years at the Gates Foundation, where, among, among other things, he uh, uh, was the Director of Agricultural Development in the Global Development Program there. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as it uh, shifted its focus from its original uh, uh, laser-like focus on, on global health, um, there, there came a recognition that uh, uh, food security and agriculture was also a huge part of the development challenge, and, and uh, Administrator Shaw was part of that process. Um, and uh, he, he also, uh, I, I keep calling him Dr. Shah, he actually is a doctor, so if anyone gets sick of the discussions, he can act actually <laughs> prescribe something for that. Um, so, so when I say a doctor, I mean a medical doctor, uh, since we have a number of other doctors in the room. Um, so I think uh, we will just take a pause in place while we wait for him. Uh, he was, we were told he was five minutes out yeah, so when gentlemen walked in, so he should be here. So I'd ask you to just stay close to your seats, um, maybe talk to the people on either side if you haven't met them, um, or introduce yourself to the person behind you, and then we'll start up again when he starts. Oh, sure, sure, that room, yeah.
Okay. So, uh, if we could uh, bring your attention back to the front of the room. I see Administrator Shah has joined us. And you are... I know, you can see us. So, having completed the introduction, I give you, Administrator <laughs> Rajiv Shah, welcome. Thank you. How are you? are all warmed up. Good, excellent. Hello, how are you? Hi, how are you? Uh, I, am, I am so uh, pleased to be able to join you here briefly today uh, for your session on public-private partnerships as part of Feed the Future. And I know that you've had uh, already a discussion with, uh, with some folks who've been able to share ideas on what's possible in this space and what we can accomplish together by partnering. And as I look around the room, I see a lot of familiar faces who have, uh, who have been leaders in this field for, uh, for some time and are really helping us to expand our ability to connect with the private sector, with universities, with research communities uh, in order to conduct the mission of Feed the Future. Uh, I did get a chance to look at your schedule today and you're going to dig into some serious stuff, genomic data, breeding, research, uh, finance-related partnerships for agricultural development, marketing. And I'm glad that you're covering the breadth of topics that together come together to create a successful agricultural transformation. I thought what I might do is just step back a moment and uh, remind us all, including myself, that you know, it really this effort was really born out of uh, the observed reality that in 2008, when food prices went up and uh, we experienced a crisis around the world, in part due to policy reactions that were suboptimal, in part due to underlying long-term structural conditions, in part due to uh, price fluctuations for a variety of reasons, we saw the reversal of a trend that basically for four decades, almost every year, the number of people who suffered from extreme poverty and hunger had been going down. And for the first time, that number went up. And when it went up, it didn't go up by just a little bit. It, we're talking about perhaps more than 100 million people were pushed back into a condition of chronic hunger and extreme poverty as a result of the confluence of factors at that point. And so when President Obama had the opportunity to bring global leaders together to address the other crisis taking place, the global financial crisis, they made a point in uh, L'Aquila, Italy, of, of taking time to make sure that as global leaders they were presenting a path forward uh, that would also deal with some of the consequences of the food crisis and food price crisis for the world's poorest communities. And it was really in that spirit that Feed the Future was born. And we made uh, several commitments as part of Feed the Future. Uh, all articulated by the president, and so we are all bound to implement them uh, effectively. One was a commitment to increase our investment in this space. And as you've seen, in very difficult fiscal environments, President Obama and Secretary Clinton have put forth and successfully secured significant investments, and we have in fact met our pledge in that moment. We committed to work with partners around the world to make sure that we weren't doing this alone, that in fact the whole world was bringing their technology and their insights to bear. And uh, Jonathan's just led a meeting of the community, of the group that comes together to assess the performance, and we will this year be, in the next few weeks and months, publishing uh, the outcomes so that we can see who's lived up to their commitments and who hasn't and double down uh, where we need people to do more. And just as importantly, we made a commitment to do things differently. I think we recognized, and certainly folks in this room are quite aware, uh, that we've seen some big successes in agriculture, certainly in this country, where agricultural productivity growth led to a larger economic transformation in uh, centuries ago. Uh, we've seen it in Asia, where at a time when people were resigned to the idea that tens, maybe hundreds of millions of people had simply star starved to death in the 70s and 80s. Uh, we saw a green revolution take hold and a doubling or tripling of food production. 
And we know that it's doable now. We know that Sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, can double or triple its actual food production in a generation. And that doing that is coupled with, in a fundamental way, uh, transforming those economies and helping to move hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and hunger. And so that's really what, what this is all about. And I am so pleased that you're together today uh, because each of these topics that you'll be discussing and working on are areas where success will only come if we build effective public-private partnerships. And, you know, people say that in government all the time. It took me a while to kind of figure out what they mean. Half the time we're talking about, you know, getting a donation from the corporate social responsibility wing of a company for something we want to do. That's really not what this is about, although uh, we welcome donations, right? <laughs> That's not what this is about. I mean, when you get into the topics here, we know that you know the new science of genomics has made it possible to do sequencing of genomes at a fraction of the cost and time frame uh, that was previously available, allows for a shorter sequence of learning and breeding and product improvement in cassava, for example, which otherwise would, would be a very long-term uh, project, but is the number one source of calories on the continent of, of Africa. And so we know that your technologies that are in your firms, in your people, in your labs, applied to these problems will make a very specific difference, and that's the kind of partnership we're seeking. Uh, when we're discussing seed technology, we're not really looking for, uh, you know, traditional donations. We're looking for product development partnerships where you can bring your germplasm, if you're a firm that has germplasm, or your research ideas and capacities, test them and integrate them with um, our programs and projects on the ground, and by doing so, develop new varieties of maize hybrids that can perform better in drought stress conditions or can uh, improve overall yields and reach families that depend on their own production for both their food and their income. Extension, I'm glad this is on as a specific topic because it's very easy to talk about technological revolutions in seeds and, uh, and fertilizers and product inputs, that's sort of easy to conceptualize. It's harder to understand that the biggest advances in smallholder extension uh, over the last decade have almost uniformly been driven by advances in technology. The fact that, you know, Bart the Airtel is reaching more than a million smallholder farmers in just a few years with a voiceover cell phone based extension model or that there are uh, groups in Sub-Saharan Africa where you can take pictures of crops, send them in, have them analyzed, and get feedback on how to best care for them. Uh, or there are NGOs that are cropping up that are using uh, videos and farmer-to-farmer -farmer methods, but different from the more traditional method of everyone sitting in plastic chairs around trees talking about their experience. That's still important. Uh, but the modern version of the farmer field school is likely to be empowered by information technology that is perhaps the most transformational force uh, that's taken hold in these communities over the last decade. And finally, agricultural finance and risk management. You know, I had the chance, uh, and I'll close with this, I had the chance this summer to visit, this fall, to visit uh, communities that were deeply affected by the drought in, um, in the Horn of Africa. Some, were, some in Somalia were labeled famine, others were high food insecure emergency communities. Uh, but in all cases, people were really, really struggling. And I had a chance to see uh, some of the newer partnerships around insurance take hold. And in a partnership between USAID and Swiss Re and some other uh, local uh, partners, there were actually a community of people that were getting paid this summer because they had rainfall indexed weather insurance uh, that is independently verified and that apparently would not have been possible just five or six years ago because the actuarial science wasn't there and the ability to monitor weather in a uniform way uh, didn't exist. And frankly, the reach, the, the reach all the way to the farm gate for a smallholder producer in a very low income rural setting was not there either. But, but technology, pri partnerships, the private sector, locally and internationally, came together. And as a result, while there were some communities where people were literally leaving their homes, leaving what was left of their belongings, picking up their children and walking 
to safety and to food and to water. Um, there were actual communities that didn't have to do that because you came together in new forms of partnership and those people benefit from an insurance product. Something as simple, I think every farmer in this country benefits from having insurance in one form or another, um, certainly with some degree of support from their government. So, uh, so I just want to say thank you. I, I think the work we're trying to do here is so very important. This is why we've set up a private sector partnership hub uh, at USAID, so you have a kind of a one-stop shop to be able to partner with, uh, with USAID and with the U.S. government uh, in our Feed the Future effort. And the four topics you've picked today are perfect examples of if we bring our technology together, if we bring our creativity together, and if we make commitments not just to do corporate social responsibility, but to build businesses that reach very poor and very vulnerable communities, we can make a huge difference. So thank you and good luck today. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you, Administrator Shah. Um, and uh, so now, as I mentioned, we're going to be breaking up. So you, uh, you said you wanted to stay. That's fine. If you stay here, you'll be hearing about uh, agricultural finance issues. Um, and then if you're on any of the other topics, you're headed out the door now to go downstairs one floor, elevators or stairs. Um, men's room, again, is on this floor if you need to make a stop and you're a man. If you're a woman, the women's room is on the second floor, so you'll be heading there on, on, your, on your way to the uh, breakout session. You have two hours to figure out the, uh, the solutions to the challenges that you're addressing, and then come back here at 4 o'clock to share with the group uh, the results. Um, any other... Uh, I want to also just recognize Lana Stoll, who's uh, been a, a leader in the effort to organize this entire event with many, many other people's help from across uh, the U.S. government. But uh, thank you all for your attention, and I look forward to hearing the results of your discussions this afternoon. Thank you. How's it going? Okay, very well.